we're particularly proud uh, to have uh, Emily, who uh, joined us uh, through uh, the Air Force, and uh, frankly, we are pleased enough with her activity that she's even staying a little longer to do her trauma critical care fellowship here. But today, we uh, honor her experience as a chief resident in our general surgery program, and she's going to talk to us about best medicine. So, Emily, thank you. Good morning, everyone, again, and thank you, Dr. Farmer, for the introduction. Um, like she said, I'll be talking about the best medicine, which, as we all know, laughter is the best medicine, and I'll be talking about laughter and humor and how it applies to us as surgeons. Um, so I'll start by saying that I am not actually funny. Uh, so. <laughs> Laugh out of pity, thank you. Um, so <laughs> this will all be a hypothetical discussion. Um, also, as many of the chief residents who have gone before me, I would like to share with you a little bit about how I came up with this topic, since I have no unique qualification that makes me any more expert on the topic than anyone else, except that I am a recovering awkward person. <laughs> really. <laughs> I can remember my first clinical rotation of medical school, third year, OBGYN, I was in the clinic and the resident assigned me a patient to go see and I remember standing outside the door and hyperventilating and thinking, I have made a huge mistake. I am not cut out for this job, I don't know how to talk to people, I'm going to forget everything that I'm supposed to ask her, she's going to find out that I don't know anything, she's going to lose faith in the healthcare system and that's going to be the end of it. That's how I felt. It was a similar feeling the first time I had to ask a patient about their bowel movements. I was mortified. She obviously knew that I was a fake and what business did I have asking her something so gross and intimate. In fact, one of the reasons I thought that I might like surgery is because I didn't want to spend my days talking to patients. But believe it or not, it has become a joy. Even though we talk about bowel movements probably more than any other specialty. I made it a goal coming into residency to figure out how to talk with patients. And I've gotten better. A huge part of that is from the confidence that has come from starting to actually know what I'm talking about. But the biggest part has, coming from, has come from watching all of you. I have spent almost six years now taking in as much as I can um, from how each of you, my mentors and colleagues, interact with patients and their families things I like, things that I can do or say, things that won't work for me for one reason or another. And then earlier this year, a medical student on my team said something to me that really made me think. He said, you know, it's a pleasure to watch you interact with patients on rounds. And I thought, wow, that's the coolest compliment. <laughs> and I'm certainly not trying to imply that I have it all figured out, but I did start thinking about what things I do that are good and um, wanting to learn more about what makes good interpersonal communication. And so that brought me to humor. Not because I'm funny, but because I think it's a really special and underrated component of effective communication and relationships. So I thought I would explore it and share my thoughts and findings with all of you. This is a bit of an outline of what I'm gonna talk about this morning. First, I'll t uh, take some time to define humor and laughter, and then I'll go uh, through a few different ways that it can be useful for us as surgeons in education, in patient care, and among professional teams. So let me start out by talking a little bit about laughter itself, which is both, both basic, primitive even, and at the same time, extremely complex, physiologically and psychologically speaking. <coughs> The physical action of laughter involves rhythmic contractions of the diaphragm, intercostal muscles, and abdominal wall musculature coupled with rhythmic abduction and adduction of the true and false vocal folds. The figure that you see here is from an Italian group that studied chest wall plethysmography and abdominal plethysmography and internal pressures during laughter. They actually had their subjects swallow pressure balloons and then watch clips of funny movies. <laughs> You can see here that both the gastric and esophageal pressures um, increase abruptly and correlate with decreased chest and abdominal volumes. This group found that the pressures evoked during laughter were significantly higher than the pressure um, needed to generate maximal expiratory flow for a given lung volume, but the functional residual capacity never decreased so far as to be at residual volume. 
This may be partially explained by the glottis limiting expiratory flow and thereby creating the vocalization of laughter. The neurologic, uh, neurologic pathways uh, that create laughter are much more complicated and still not entirely understood. By that, I mostly mean that I don't understand it. But the neuroscientists also have still a fair amount to work out. What we do know is that there are overlapping pathways and that they change throughout development and based upon the stimulus for laughter. To simplify it for our purposes, it can be broken down into three main processes. The cognitive process, which is what allows us to understand a joke or interpret a situation as humorous, takes place in the right frontal and prefrontal cortex. The motor process, which produces laughter like we saw in the previous slide, takes place in the supplemental motor area. And finally, the emotional process, which elicits the happy feelings associated with humor, is attributed to the nucleus accumbens and other parts of the limbic system. The cognitive process of humor being in the frontal lobe interestingly explains how humor and sense of humor changes throughout a lifetime. The frontal lobe continues to change and mature throughout development and into the late 20s. Children will tend to find more humor in the slapstick sort of physical comedy provided in cartoons, where more mature audiences will appreciate satire and other more sophisticated forms of humor that require understanding of context and social situations. As humans, we tend to have two types of laughter, real or belly laughing and polite or social laughing. Belly laughter is longer, usually higher pitched and generally involuntary. <laughs> polite or social laughter is not actually fake laughter, although it certainly can be. It's just more posed. It is still an important nonverbal communication tool and social cue. It's voluntary, and we tend to use it to let people know that we understand them, that we like them, that we're on the same page with them. Based on those examples, you can tell that we actually have a pretty easy time identifying real versus posed laughter. But that's also something that changes throughout development. There was a study that looked at this, having people differentiate between um, sound bites, between real and posed laughter. And it turns out that people didn't reach peak performance in this data set until ages late 30s and early 40s. So humor and laughter and understanding its social implications is something that we continue to learn about and develop well into adulthood. I noticed that you all laughed when I played the clips of Vicini and Mr. Data laughing. That's because laughter is contagious. It engages areas of the brain that facilitate social reciprocity. And we're much more likely to assimilate positive emotions than negative ones. I found this so interesting. <laughs> this image is from another study that looked at fMRI of people listening to laughter and they found that people with psychopathic traits, antisocial and violent behavior, had significantly reduced neural responses to laughter. So if you can't process laughter, you might be a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> Humor is a complicated thing. <laughs> Did Dr. Drakovich didn't laugh? <laughs> There's no real consensus about what humor actually is, and there are no strict rules about what would or would not be considered humorous. But there have been many theories over hundreds of years. The three classical theories are the relief theory, the superiority theory, and the incongruity resolution theory. The relief theory is exactly what it sounds like. According to this theory, laughter is a homeostatic mechanism whereby psychological tension is reduced. The release of nervous energy brings about laughter. This theory also maintains that humor is used mainly to over overcome inhibitions and reveal, um, reveal suppressed desires. It may come as no surprise that Sigmund Freud espoused this theory. The superiority theory, which traces back to Plato and Aristotle, maintains that humor is based in schadenfreude, or the feeling of joy at the misfortune of others because we tend to enjoy feeling superior. 
Plato wrote that the essence of the ridiculous is an ignorance in the weak, who are thus unable to retaliate when ridiculed. Aristotle suggested that an ugliness that does not disgust is fundamental to humor. Your mama jokes tend to fall into this category. It also helps us to understand why self-deprecating humor can be so effective. The incongruity theory is one in which the humor is said to come at the moment of realization of incongruity between the punchline and the setup. This is a theory that has been around for several hundred years as well, and it took me a while to understand it, so I'll give you an example. There are two fish in a tank. One says to the other, do you know how to drive this thing? <coughs> it becomes funny when you realize that the tank that they are in is not the aquarium that you expected when I set up the joke, but rather the military combat vehicle, and it becomes even funnier when you consider how irresponsible it would be to have fish driving a tank. <laughs> Humor can be verbal, visual, or physical, and it can be classified in many different ways. The perception of humor depends heavily on context, including the experiences of the audience, their mood, their level of education, the geographic location, even the weather. What is funny to me may not be funny to you, and what is funny to you today may not be funny to you next week. One key, uh, one key feature, though, of most types of humor is that it is meant to be shared. People rarely make jokes merely for their own amusement. Humor is an interpersonal strategy. It's a way to build camaraderie and to connect with people in a joyful way. So now that I have picked apart humor and laughter so that it's not fun anymore, I want to talk about how we can use humor for education. Because on some level, we're all students perpetually, and we're also all teachers. We teach our patients, we teach our students, we teach each other, and humor can be a very useful tool for this. I remember in medical school when my classmates and I would come up with ingenious song parodies to help us remember all the microorganisms and antibiotics. Also, almost everyone in my class had the book Clinical Microbiology Made Ridiculously Simple. It was ridiculously simple because it was full of funny pictures like this one that worked as memory tools for the material. You can see the penicillin chomping its way along the cell wall and a rhino with a cold drinking a Corona to remind you of the two most common uh, viruses responsible for the common cold. It was extremely effective because humor has actually been proven to help us remember things and learn better. Here's a study from 1988 in the Journal of Experimental Education in which a university statistics professor taught half of his classes using jokes and humorous stories to illustrate his concepts and the other half with no humor at all, learning identical information. The students in the classes with humor scored 10% higher on the final exam than the students in the classes without humor. The study was repeated with university psychology classes and the results were similar. And since then, similar findings have been demonstrated in other university and high school classroom studies. In my own experience, the humor strategy works better than anything I know. I have to say, I don't remember a lot of what I learned in junior high. But I vividly remember learning integers and number lines in Mrs. Schindler's eighth grade math class because she had us dance out our positive and negative numbers to the electric slide. Yeah. <laughs> I was not actually able to find any videos of this for my presentation. So you'll have to imagine the X and Y axis laid out in masking tape on the floor of my pre-algebra classroom as I play this next clip. Positive two, negative two, negative three, positive one, negative one. Right? See it. I thought about dancing it, but then the heel. They don't make music videos like they used to. <laughs> this is not unique to classroom learning. Anyone who's had the privilege of discussing ventilator modes in the ICU with Dr. Zach Luzny will never forget how APRV works. <coughs> it looks complicated. Learning APRV by studying this figure would take at least a moderate amount of brain power. But Dr. Zach Luzny has an APRV-inspired interpretive dance. I would love to share it with you. 
but I was never sly enough to catch it on video. <laughs> I haven't given up though. He does make it easy enough that it would be worth considering developing other ventilator mode dances. I'm considering it as an educational project for my next year in the ICU. <laughs> In the field of memory research, there has been a lot of work done on studying the effect of humor and how it helps us remember information. This has to do with increasing attention as well as the positive emotions associated with the humorous experience, which leads to preferential encoding and retrieval of information by the brain. This is a Dutch study published in the Journal of General Psychology that used eye tracking technology to show that subjects spent significantly longer viewing humorous information when compared to similar but non-humorous information. Essentially, this implies that we find humorous information inherently interesting, and so we pay more attention to it. This has been studied quite a bit and applied exuberantly in the advertising industry. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using lady scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamond. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. <laughs> is that real? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People remember the Old Spice ad campaign, similar to the Holiday Inn Express commercials or the Snickers commercials or so many others. We remember things that make us laugh and we associate those positive feelings with the products. Next I want to change gears a little bit and talk about how humor can be used to enhance our relationships with our patients. As I've been reflecting on my training here, I realized that the surgeons whom I most admire are those who not only are technically excellent and thorough, but who also develop outstanding rapport with their patients. Humor can be a wonderful way to help develop that rapport and the therapeutic relationship. It can help to calm or reassure patients, to normalize their feelings or fears, and to reduce embarrassment or discomfort at awkward moments or procedures. I'm not suggesting that we all go around cracking fish tank jokes at every patient encounter, but it can be helpful to give a patient something to smile about. It can be difficult as a resident to meet a patient for the first time in the pre-op area and expect to develop any sort of relationship with that patient. This could open up a whole nother discussion about the utility of having more clinic experience in residency, but I think that it's actually a useful ex exercise for people like me who are going into subspecialties in which we don't really have the luxury of time always to get to know our patients well before surgery. And so using those five minutes in the pre-op room effectively can really have a big impact. Something that's worked well for me is that once I introduce myself and let them know that I'm one of the residents and that I'll be assisting with their operation, I usually say, how are you doing this morning? You ready to get this over with? And almost always the patient will smile or give a little chuckle. And it's not like that is a hilarious joke, but it lets the patient know that I recognize that they have some level of anxiety about the situation and that it's normal and okay. And that little chuckle can be a release of tension, like I talked about earlier with the relief theory. I'm not trying to say that I'm breaking new ground with this or even that it's very creative, but it's a small example of something simple that I've noticed makes my patients more at ease. This is my beautiful big sister, Jennifer. When she was 10 years old, she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. When she was in the hospital, her endocrinologist came to teach her and my parents about what it means to have diabetes. She started by asking my sister if she knew anything about the condition, which she did a little bit because there was another boy in her class with diabetes as well. The doctor told Jen how great it was for her to know a little bit coming in and she told her that one time they had a little boy there who was just crying and crying and when they could finally calm him down enough to talk he said, I don't want to die of beaties. And it made Jen laugh. This devastated little girl who had just been given a life sentence, it was so important and meaningful for her to have that moment of connection and relief and she still remembers it 25 years later. This is my beautiful mom. She has very thin hair, which she has been self-conscious about for many years. A couple of years ago, she saw a dermatologist about it and started taking spironolactone, which has actually worked remarkably well. 
Last month, my mom donated a kidney to a stranger. This is Dr. Rajab, her surgeon. At her first pre-donation appointment with him, he came in uh, brow furrowed, thumbing through her paperwork, and his first question was, what do you take spironolactone for? A reasonable question when it comes to kidney surgery. My mom's reply was, it's for hair growth. You should try it. <laughs> and they laughed together. They connected and the pressure was off. It set the tone for the encounter. And this was my dad. He had the most wonderful sense of humor. My dad had heart disease and for several years his cardiologist recommended an ICD. He was resistant to it for a while but eventually caved to my mom's pressure. And less than a year after it was placed, he had a V-fib arrest and the defibrillator saved his life with one shock. Now, I'm sure many of you have gotten uh, cards or tokens of, of appreciation from patients that you've helped, but my dad took it a step further. He wrote a letter to his cardiologist from Satan <laughs> that reads along the lines of con congratulating a worthy adversary. Like, you win this round, Medtronic. <laughs> Medtronic and Dr. Krebs actually won the first several rounds, but you can't win them all. And the other side eventually took it. My dad died during my research year after six years of borrowed time. But the point of all this is that each of these cases illustrates a person with a stressful, devastating, or even near-death experience who was able to find a moment of levity and laughter to connect with a doctor and cope better with whatever it was that they were handling. And maybe my family is just sillier than most, but I really believe that in general, our patients want to laugh with us. They want to connect with us. And I think that it's important for us to be open to that and to make those opportunities available when we can. Similar to anything else that we do with our patients, humor has the potential to bring great benefits, but also carries the risk of causing harm. Everybody say, ah, oh, ah, oh. <laughs> When an attempt at humor fails, usually everybody involved knows it. It can be from a misjudgment of timing or of the audience or of any number of contextual factors. There are few people that are sensitive enough to have perfect foresight in all situations so nearly everyone makes the occasional faux pas. Now this example from Scrubs most likely didn't cause irreparable damage to the relationship between JD and his patient. But just like anything else we do, attention to detail and situational awareness are the keys to both effective use of humor as well as to mending relationships after a failed attempt. <laughs> the last topic that I want to address is the role of humor in the workplace among professional teams and how we can use it as surgeons and team leaders. As I've mentioned previously, humor can help relieve tension and foster camaraderie. It can improve motivation, focus, well-being, and creativity. People who use humor at work are more productive, less stressed, paid more, and happier. There is a load of research in the psychology and business worlds backing this up. So how can this apply to surgeons? Would surgeons be open to using humor? Dr. Pevick used to make the junior residents tell jokes to occupy the time while holding pressure. Hemostasis jokes. It was a rare, relaxing moment in what was otherwise usually a fairly stressful case. <laughs> there are a lot of elements of surgery that set us up to have a stressful working environment, not the least of which is that there are frequently direct life or death implications of our actions. But in addition to that, there, has what, there is what has come to be referred to as the surgical personality. And it's hard to say whether the stressful nature of what we do begets certain personality characteristics or if certain types of people are attracted to the field. But what we do know is that we've been stereotyped for better or for worse over generations. Depending on who you ask, you may get the more positive flavor of descriptors like assertive, competitive, decisive, or you may hear the less flattering, arrogant, explosive, abrasive, or a rapidly fluctuating personality. 
People have been studying. <laughs> People have been studying the surgical personality for decades. The earliest paper that I found was from 1975 when they used Rorschach tests to compare medical to surgical residents at Harvard. There have been loads of papers on the subject since using all sorts of different personality assessment tools, even as recently as one published just last month in the Journal of Surgical Research. Some have shown very convincing personality differences. Some have shown no difference at all. But the bottom line is that we wouldn't keep studying it if we weren't totally interested in ourselves. <laughs> I'm certainly not above such self-interest, so naturally I had to conduct my own study. I used a 27-question personality survey sent to 104 surgery residents at a single Northern California institution. <laughs> 60 residents responded. One was excluded because she had her husband fill out the survey on her behalf, <laughs> leaving 59 residents for analysis. Survey results were categorized into one of 13 potential personality permutations. What I found was that a whopping 76% of residents fell into one of two categories. Han Solo and Boba Fett. The largest minority matched with Finn, we had a few outliers, and of these, um, you know, for diversity. Um, of these 59 residents, we have only one single Jedi. <laughs> so what can be said about these two characters to whom almost all of our residents objectively relate? When I did some digging into the nitty-gritty Star Wars personality analysis, I was pleased to find that there's precedent for this type of study, and even more pleased to find that my results corroborated the existing data. Surgery is Han Solo. I think most of us could have predicted that. That has actually been borne out in other analyses as well. <laughs> for those of you who are not familiar with Scrubs, this guy's the surgery resident. <laughs> But then I had to reconcile all these Boba Fetts that we came up with. When you think about it, he's pretty similar to Han Solo. Both are resourceful, scrappy, and independent, but Boba Fett is a little more mysterious and villainous. So I looked again to see what Gomer Blog had to say on the subject. And here it is, the truth. Is Dr. Salcedo here? I can provide you with a list of names after the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. It wasn't me. I considered expanding this study to include faculty, and I did pilot it among a single division to determine feasibility and safety. I had 42% participation of surveyed faculty and found similar results to the residents. <laughs> what, I <laughs> what I learned from this study, first of all, was that surgeons love funny things. For instance, a ridiculous request from a resident to fill out a Star Wars personality survey. <laughs> the interns kept telling me about their text chain and how they were all bragging to each other about being Han Solo. <laughs> And I truly wish that all of you could have been there in the Davis 12 workroom with me one evening when I had Dr. Bold on one side and Dr. Cantor on the other, both filling out their quizzes and trash talking each other. Like, you're going to be Darth Vader. <laughs> the important thing to take from this is that whether or not there is uh, surgical personality. The perception is that there is. One paper that I read from the American Journal of Surgery said, typically individuals and groups within the hospital and medical school environments often devise methods of circumventing most surgeons because we are considered to be difficult or challenging. Perception is reality. And if this is really how we are generally perceived, then it's worth it in the interest of patient care and just pleasant working environments to make an effort to change it. Elliot Reed, John Dorian, great. <laughs> <laughs>
One, I am your resident, Dr. Jeffrey Stedman. Not Jeff. Two, here are your manuals. You ever notice how quickly some people make an impression? I'm a tool. I'm a tool. I'm a tool. <laughs> <laughs> an annoying tool. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, these are your beepers. From now on, they control your entire life. Okay. Thanks. Move it. <laughs> For the record, that guy was not a surgeon. But I picked the clip to illustrate how little it takes to make an impression. I talked earlier about how laughter and positive attitudes are contagious. If we want people to see that we really do have a beautiful personality, why not use a little humor? Or at least happiness. If they can hear our happiness, those same happy parts of their brain will light up too. Unless they're a psychopath. <laughs> The obvious example for the residents is answering the phone or pager. Even when we know it's going to be a consult, after a 15th consult, answering the phone like a grumpy surgeon isn't going to make anyone want to work with us. I'm as guilty of that as the next person, but I'm working on it. You can hear a smile over the phone, and it doesn't cost you anything. I mentioned earlier that job satisfaction is higher in people who use humor in the workplace, as well as in people whose leadership use humor in the workplace. This is a particu uh, this particularly important to me because burnout and career dissatisfaction is a real problem among surgeons in this country. It has become a huge area of research in recent years. There was a study published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons in 2009 by our very own Drs. Trotman that showed 15% of surgeons were dissatisfied with their careers and a whopping 40% would not recommend a surgical career to their own children. Similar results have been echoed in multiple studies over the years. Just last week we had a phenomenal grand rounds with Dr. Bill Moria whose research is truly moving mountains to improve well-being and decrease burnout among surgical residents. The other is a study that surveyed 192 nurses investigating the association between humor and the three dimensions of burnout, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. They found that the use of humor in the workplace and as a coping strategy was associated with lower emotional exhaustion, lower depersonalization, and higher sense of personal accomplishment across the board. So how can we help each other out? It seems to me that if humor has been proven to improve job satisfaction and decrease burnout, that's something we can work on without a lot of effort. I'm certainly not trying to imply that a hemostasis joke every now and then is going to make all the difference, but it probably won't hurt. And here's my favorite one to get you started. What do you call a cheese that doesn't belong to you? Nacho cheese. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful outpouring of a new look at how we practice our career. Thank you. Thank you. I'm reminded of uh, a book I recently read by, I think her last name is Kane, Susan Kane, called Quiet. Uh, it's a book about how introverts um, have been largely overlooked in a world that talks all the time, yet they bring great value to the world. And I immediately thought of that book while I was listening to a presentation and the journey you've been through and trying to develop a way to express yourself in a person who's naturally shy about expressing himself. So, well done. I highly recommend the book. It changed my perspective on looking at people. Comments? Emily, anything else for Emily? She'd call out a joke from everybody? <laughs> I thought about it. Why did the residents not respond? Why didn't you get a 100% response rate? I don't understand that. You well, should have. There were, there were a few divisions that had low participation. Really? But. Yeah. <laughs> The research residents could use a little work, guys. <laughs> the, uh, the example you gave of, uh, of um, uh, kudos to yourself from a, a, a medical student, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. We all value that tremendously. I was wondering if you could recall what prompted that comment in particular. Do you remember the patient or the event or anything? Yeah, I remember it very clearly. We were up in the workroom. We were just kind of doing a little bit of education and talking about, you know, the list. And it was totally unprompted. He, we were just sitting around, yeah, and he was just like, you know, let me talk. And I was like, oh. it, was, it was really, it was a big moment for me. Catherine. <laughs> what a refreshing uh, perspective of how we should 
interact with those patients. But I have a question for you. So you had mentioned the surgical personality and the traits that we as surgeons have, which are often very positive when we're taking care of patients because meticulous perfectionism, a little compulsive behavior is often very positive in getting the outcomes that we want. However, that's also not so good for the well-being of the surgeon and the, the healthcare provider. How do how can we have those two things come together and still be still expect and know that we're going to have that that personality, which I think is a positive thing in many respects, but also take care of the surgeons and the other healthcare providers. Yeah, I think that's an outstanding point. That's sort of the elephant in the room, I think. Um, and my perspective on it would be, you know, I, I don't think, I'm not here to change anyone's personality. I think we have a beautiful personality. But um, just being sort of more open to laughing a little bit, like not taking ourselves so seriously and laughing with each other, laughing with our patients, I think that can sort of kind of just reduce the the burden on us and we still you know we can still have all of that meticulousness <laughs> and compulsion but sort of channel it into our work and not into our interpersonal relationships mike i noticed you took one part of the top particularly humorous uh, yeah i yeah. wonder if you're going to share that, <laughs> that, that, little, uh, that a little inside sort of oncology joke <laughs> Dr. Cantor-isms, I guess. <laughs> once in a while. But, you know, it, this is a great talk. I mean, we talked about this uh, as you were writing it, and I'm so happy to finally see it come to fruition because uh, I know how hard you worked on it. Um, uh, and I got to admit, when you first told me, I was a little bit surprised to say that when you told me you were an introvert, you would have never probably gotten that. Uh, when I first met you were three, six years ago. Uh, but I want to launch a little bit of a, a dangerous philosophical question at you and see how you respond to it. And that is, you know, humor is, in my mind, a wonderful way to relate to your patients and your residents. Um, but it's also a little dangerous because it's in the interpreter. It tends to be interpreted. And I'm curious as to, I don't know, ways that you have found to walk that line between not offending people and but at the same time being yourself. Um, which I think is probably the most difficult part of using humor in education and in, in patient care. So, I don't know, have you, as you kind of went through this journey of learning about how to, be, how to relate with your patients through humor, like what did you find more, what do you think doesn't work, or what are your cues? Well, um, that is another interesting question. Thank you, and thank you for your help with writing my talk. Um, something... One of the papers that I read actually said, I, I don't remember the, what exactly the wording was, but it said humor in patient interactions has to be an expert performance, which I thought was really sort of poignant uh, because it is, like you said, it can be very damaging. Um, and I tried to touch on that a little bit. I, I didn't want to touch on it too much because I don't want to discourage people from, you know, having a little bit of levity. but. Um, and, and like I said before, I'm not actually that funny, excuse me, so I don't, I don't really like make, you know, grand jokes or anything with my patients, but just sort of, you know, reading the room, kind of, you know, see, I feel like it's, it's just kind of a feeling you can get if this patient might be open to kind of laughing with you a little bit, you know, if you're, you know, if you're about to tell a patient, you know, you have cancer and you're going to die. You know, that's not, maybe not a time. <laughs> but, but, you know, just each situation and in patient, you know, on rounds, it's, you know, the patients that I kind of develop the relationship with that we've talked to every day and we can just, you know, kind of shoot the breeze a little bit. Um, you know, those are the situations that I find it works really well in. Um, and then we have a better relationship, you know, moving forward. Um, but it's also, um, it's worth sort of noting that you won't always make the right judgment. And sometimes you'll say something that you meant to be funny or humorous and it falls flat. And 
being aware of that and being sensitive to that and um, is really important to being able to sort of come back from it, mend the relationship. I'm sorry, it's not what I meant, you know. And um, I think that that's a really important thing to be aware of as well. Big challenge, big challenge. Dr. Zach Luzzi, who makes jokes to patients on the ventilators. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a skill like any other that has to be, you know, practiced to be developed before you can really get good at it, and it takes some trial and error. One last one, thanks. I was just saying, like, when you mentioned this earlier, you were talking about situational awareness and how that can be really important. And oftentimes, we'll kind of get cues from the patients that I notice when they're on their luggage and they want to laugh and even say, can you tell me a joke? Because they're just there sitting in bed and they want to have, like, some kind of connection. And I think you just have to look for that open-ended kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Emily, for your terrific and special grammar.